Hey, what's up you lot, Path here, and in today's video, we are talking about an idea that some of you will be familiar with already, the idea of a simple harmonic oscillator. But we're going to take this simple harmonic oscillator and translate it into the world of quantum mechanics, and we're going to see just how useful this can be. If you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Also, in the description box below, you will find a document that I've written up containing a few questions that you can have a go at in order to help you understand this video a little bit better. The document also has some answers at the end, but a video containing detailed solutions of each question will be uploaded onto my brand new Patreon page. Anyway, that's enough chit chat, let's get into it. So, a simple harmonic oscillator is any object that displays a kind of motion known as simple harmonic motion. A really good example is a mass attached to a spring. And let's say that the mass is placed on a frictionless surface, which means it can freely move backwards and forwards as the spring compresses or extends. Now, initially in this diagram, the mass spring system is at rest, and we can say that the spring is at its natural length. But if we now change this by either extending or compressing the spring and then letting it go, then the kind of motion that we see going on here, this sort of back and forth oscillation, specifically is known as simple harmonic motion. And of course, here we're making the assumption that the system doesn't lose energy to its surroundings, so the spring is not heating up. And because we've got a frictionless floor, there's no energy lost there or anything. So in essence, we've got a perfect system that will just keep pinging back and forth. Now, a characteristic of simple harmonic motion is that the restoring force, the force that causes the mass to move, the force exerted by the spring, is directly proportional to the extension or compression of that spring. In other words, the further the spring is from its natural length, whether it's compressed or extended, the larger the force it exerts on the mass to bring it back to its equilibrium position. And we've just mentioned another important characteristic here. The force has to be acting in the opposite direction to the displacement. Now the spring mass system indeed does display the characteristics we've mentioned so far, which is why we say it's undergoing simple harmonic motion specifically. But now let's move forward a little bit. Let's think about the potential energy stored in the spring as it compresses and extends. If you've studied springs before, you'll recall that for a perfect spring, the potential energy stored in it is equal to half multiplied by k multiplied by x squared where k is known as the spring constant and is a property of that particular spring, and x is simply the displacement from the equilibrium position. The important thing here is that the potential energy is proportional to x squared, it's quadratic. This means that for x is equal to one centimeter, for example, the potential energy is equal to half k, whatever k might be, that's not really important. But if we double the displacement, if we say x is equal to two, then the potential energy is four times larger, that's two squared. We can make a plot of the potential energy stored in the spring, which for classical physics can serve as a really good analogy. We can imagine that this potential energy well is almost like a valley, and we can imagine a ball moving up and down the sides of this valley, corresponding to the simple harmonic motion of the mass spring system. As the potential energy stored in the spring changes throughout the oscillation, so the ball moves up and down the potential energy slope. Of course, what we haven't accounted for here is that when the potential energy stored in the spring is very low, the kinetic energy of the mass is very high, but that's not really relevant to us right now. One thing we do care about is the total energy of the system, though, and we can easily calculate this when the spring is either at its most compressed or most extended in the oscillation. Because at this point, all of the energy in the system is potential energy and none of it is kinetic energy. And equivalently, the ball is as high as it can be in our potential well. The height that this metaphorical ball can reach is directly related to the energy that we gave the system when we first set off the oscillations. In other words, let's say we extended the spring this far and then we released it. We will never see the spring going further than this distance. We will never see it extending more than its initial extension. So as we can see, this diagram that we've drawn of the ball moving up and down the potential energy slope is kind of useful, it's intuitive in a way. We can see that the ball will never go higher than the point it was initially let go from, and the idea is that that ball can have any amount of energy depending on how much energy we give it right at the beginning. So, as we've said, we've come up with a really nice analogy for a classical simple harmonic oscillator. But this kind of breaks down when we go into the realm of quantum mechanics. Before we do that though, just a quick reminder, there's a document linked in the description below with a few questions that you can attempt after watching this video. I highly recommend you check it out, and please do let me know if those questions are useful, if they're too easy, or if they're too difficult. Anyway, if you've seen one of my older videos about quantum tunneling, linked up here if you haven't seen it already, you'll remember that quantum particles, or quantum systems for that matter, can also interact with potential wells. 
Let's imagine we've got a particle that can move along the x-axis, or the horizontal axis. But as it does so, it experiences varying amounts of electric potential, for example, generated by charges that might be in the vicinity. Again, not very important, check out the video on quantum tunneling for more details. The idea is that quantum particles can also interact with potential wells, that's what's important. And we can imagine a quantum particle interacting with a quadratic well, just like the simple harmonic oscillator from earlier. This time though, because we're looking at a quantum system, we have to use the Schrodinger equation. A quantum system is defined by its wave function, which is basically a mathematical formulation of all the information we know about that system, and the behavior of this wave function is determined by the Schrodinger equation. In this equation, this term refers to the kinetic energy of the particle, and this term refers to its potential energy. So in this case, we're going to substitute that quadratic potential well for the potential energy. In essence, then, we are solving Schrodinger's equation for a particular potential well, and we're going to see how these quantum particles behave. When we do this, what we find is super interesting. The first thing to note is that these particles can only have specific energies in the quantum world. This is known as the quantization of these energies. Unlike in the classical world, when we could have a simple harmonic oscillator with basically any energy that we wanted, and all this depended on was how far along we pushed the spring. Quantum particles can only have specific energies. Now this is true for general quantum systems, not just the quadratic one we happen to be studying here. But what is interesting about the quadratic system is that these energy levels are equally spaced. This is not necessarily true for other potential wells, such as the square well, for example, which is one of the first things that you study when you learn quantum mechanics. But for a quadratic potential well, the energy levels are equally spaced. Now, another interesting thing to note is that every particle must be in one of these energy levels, and this is the lowest possible energy level. That lowest possible energy is not zero. In other words, a quantum system in a quadratic potential well must have a minimum amount of energy that is not zero. This lowest possible energy level is known as the ground state, and the energy difference between that energy level and the bottom of the quadratic potential well is known as the zero point energy. This aligns very nicely, by the way, with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There is a minimum amount of energy that the particles must have. Now, there are some subtleties and complications that aren't being discussed here, but the important thing is that the classical harmonic oscillator could have basically any value of energy we wanted to give it, including zero energy. But the quantum harmonic oscillator must be in quantized energy levels, and it cannot have zero energy. Let's now move on to looking at what the wave functions in our quantum harmonic oscillator look like for each energy level. They look like this. Now, I've mentioned in a previous video, by the way, that these diagrams are terrible. We're trying to represent the energy on the same axis as the wave functioniness of our system. In reality, we should have a different axis for representing the magnitude or size of the wave function, but we'll run with it for now. Remember that a wave function is directly related to the probability with which we will find our particle at a particular position. Specifically, squaring these wave functions gives us a probability distribution. So for example, with this energy level, we're highly likely to find our particle at x is equal to 1, say, but there is no chance of finding it at x is equal to 0. That's not the interesting bit though. Look at these regions over here. The square of the wave function in these regions is not 0 which means there is some probability of finding our particles in these regions. This completely goes against our classical intuition. If we come back to our classical harmonic oscillator from earlier, this is the equivalent of saying that we set off our spring oscillating, and at some point we are likely to find our mass over here, for example. But what we've just seen for the quantum harmonic oscillator is that we can find particles in these classically forbidden regions. Again, this is discussed in more detail in my quantum tunneling video, but it's interesting to see that that also happens for quadratic potential wells, and therefore for quantum harmonic oscillators. At this point, we've taken in a lot in this video, and there's one more thing I want to talk about before we recap everything. There's a question that pops up, and that question is, what is the point of a quantum harmonic oscillator? Why do we care? Like, studying a quadratic potential well in the quantum realm is interesting and all, but what's the relevance of it? Well, as it turns out, in real life, quantum particles interact with very complicated potential wells. Luckily though, many of these potential wells are smooth and many of these regions can be approximated as quadratic. We can represent them as quantum harmonic oscillators with the quadratic well squished and stretched to fit as closely as possible. And then, without doing a lot of complicated mathematics and plugging in this weird looking potential into the Schrodinger equation, we can estimate what's happening in certain regions of this potential landscape by approximating some parts as a quantum harmonic oscillator. A very basic example of this is a one-dimensional lattice, so basically a row, of positively charged ions. 
This is commonly seen in like metals, for example, though obviously extended to three dimensions. Because of these positively charged ions, an electron in the electron C would experience a potential that looks like this. And in this region, for example, we can see how the electron would interact with the potential well by simply approximating it as a quadratic potential well. I'm of course massively oversimplifying this, but this is the basis for studying the behavior of solids where atoms can be arranged in such neat lattices, for example. This is why the quantum harmonic oscillator becomes very, very important in the world of quantum mechanics. And with all of that being said, I'm going to end the video here. Thanks so much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed it, please do hit the thumbs up button and feel free to subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Please do check out the written document, link below, where you can try some questions after watching this video. And obviously that document contains some basic solutions, but if you want detailed solutions in video format, then please do check out my Patreon page. I also have a second channel where I post my own original music, Path G Shenanigans, and I have an Instagram at PathVlogs. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, I really appreciate all of your support. Thank you, thank you so much. I'll see you really soon.